Hello young illustrators. My name is Robert Young and today I'm going to talk about some of the markets of illustration. I say some of because there are tons of them. So generally I'm going to go over the major markets of illustration, the ones you might even already be familiar with a little bit, uh, and talk about what they are, kind of what goes on in them. Uh, some of these also have some bleed over into some other areas. An illustration or a client can kind of exist in, in different markets. So these are by no means hard and fast set in stone rules, just general guidelines on the markets of illustration. Uh, it's also important to note that you don't need to silo yourself and just pick one. Um, if you're interested in comics, great, make comics. That doesn't mean that you can't make animation. That doesn't mean that you can't work in video games. It doesn't mean that you can't, um, you know, work in editorial illustration. It's just some loose guidelines uh, to sort of give us some distinction so that we can even talk about the industry of illustration. So the first market I'm going to talk about is editorial. So this is newspapers, magazines, blogs. Um, you know, historically, this was uh, illustration entirely in print. Now that's not really the case, and you know some some publications who have been running in print for a long time have switched over to a digital only format. Uh, regardless of whether or not it's printed in a newspaper or on the New York Times app, it is an editorial illustration if it is um, illustrating editorial content. So that is generally copy or uh, articles that have some sort of editorial slant. It's not just man bites dog, it's uh, what does that mean in this context? How does it affect these people? Uh, here's my opinion on man, man bites dog. And that's why you'll, you know, you don't really see a lot of illustrations for news pieces about, you know, a, a volcano exploding when it's just this, it, you know, the, the sort of straight facts about the volcano exploding. So here's one for the New York Times by illustrator Richie Pope. And uh, Mr. Pope is a, is a good example of an illustrator who's not siloed. So, you know, he's doing an illustration here for the New York Times, but he also does other work and, and uh, makes comics, self-published comics. Uh, sells prints, you know, through his website. A lot of illustrators kind of fit this model of working in different markets. So one of the things with uh, with editorial illustration is that you know you really have to understand the the content um, and how to how to visually display it in a way that's you know, going to give a different level, a deeper level of understanding maybe even than the, than the copy or the text of the article, but they should complement each other. So, you know, if you, if you pick out just some word or thing that's in the middle of the article, but not really what the article's about, then it doesn't really encompass the, the whole thing. So, um, you, you're also going to see a lot of visual metaphor. So, there is some very literal illustration in editorial but uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with complex ideas, visual metaphor is a really good tool for showing those to your audience and having them understand it. Here's one by Daniel Fischel for Politico. You know, why, why the AARP is worried about student loans. So you can see these parents in the audience kind of um, uh, watching their their kids graduation and they're throwing the you know mortar boards in the air and it's casting the shadow and they look kind of like proud and worried at the same time that's different than just saying like hey the you know student loans are worrisome this gives it a different deeper level of meaning here's one for uh, i believe cycling world this is by illustrator greg kletzel Another illustrator who works in a lot of different places, so uh, self-published comics, uh, risograph prints, editorial, commercial, 
Um, and I think now he's working for Adult Swim, so in in animation. So, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of illustrators again work in different markets of illustration pretty regularly. Uh, here's uh, an illustrator, Kadir Nelson, uh, doing an illustration for a pretty recent cover of Rolling Stone about all of the um, you know, civil unrest and, and protests re revolving around uh, the treatment of black people in the United States, uh, kind of spawning from Black Lives Matter and the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, Kadir has been doing a lot of uh, covers specifically recently, um, and you know, one of uh, George Floyd that's probably the most well-known illustration of George Floyd. So here we see like this is pretty literal uh, in that you could take a photo of it, but the styling, the mood, the setting, the, the sort of quality, the visual quality of the piece is different than something that you're going to get uh, from a simple photograph. <clears throat> uh, f you know, food illustration is kind of a, uh, editorial food illustration is kind of a niche even inside of editorial illustration. So here's one for MSN by illustrator Alex Citron. Uh, and, you know, it's about tacos. It's about food. It's about um, how how we interact with food. Food is a, a cultural uh, or societal understanding. So, yeah, you know, maybe you could just photograph a basket of tacos, but it doesn't have the same flair. It doesn't communicate the same thing. Uh, editorial assignments tend to be pretty quick turnaround, anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of days to maybe a week or two at most, and that's for you know bigger stories that were planned in advance or you know covers sometimes. But if you're doing editorial for newspapers and the newspaper publishes every day uh, or once a week, then you know you know there, there's not going to be that much time. On to commercial illustration. So commercial illustration is uh, kind of a broad term and some people will use the, the term commercial illustration to refer to any illustration that was done for uh, kind of an outside client who's representing a company. Uh, so some people will refer to editorial as commercial illustration or they'll refer to um, surface design for textiles and clothing as commercial illustration. So. The way that I use it is a little bit different. Uh, there's there's not really one correct way. So when I'm talking about commercial illustration, I'm talking about stuff for advertising, packaging, and products. That's just a little bit different than some of the other categories. So here's one for a company called Lava Life, which was a dating service. And the illustration is by Marcos Chen. So, you know, there, there are some, you know, you'll see some visual metaphor again. Um, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to relate the mood, the sort of attitude or, or like lifestyle that this company is trying to put across for itself. If you've ever seen Mad Men, it's a lot like that uh, without, you know, the drinking and all, all the chicanery. Um, you are trying to create images that tell the customer you know this is what your life will be like you will you'll have you know this this metaphor of all of this choice this you know huge choice of uh, potential partners if you use lavalife.com here's one for copic markers um, you know so they have a marker that has a thick chisel tip on one side and a fine point on the other side and um, I'm I don't know who was the illustrator or designer on this. Sometimes that happens with commercial illustration where it just becomes really difficult to actually find out who did the work. Um, but in this one, you know, again, visual metaphor, you've got the thick side uh, drawing out this sort of burly, gnarly, possibly one-eyed bear. Uh, and then the thin side, this sort of delicate violin. So the thick side is like a rougher, grittier thing. And the fine side is like more uh, cultured or, you know, a little, little bit different quality to it apart from it just being a thick and a thin side so again using visual metaphor uh, and then here's another one same deal you've got this 
luchador wrestler reading a book of poetry. Uh, here's one for Greg, Greg Kletzel again. So, you know, I showed an editorial example. Now here's one uh, that I believe he did for Etsy. Uh, and here's Greg Kletzel again doing something for uh, Netflix for their show Disenchantment. Uh, so this is just advertising the show. So I kind of put that under commercial as well. Here's one from uh, French artist Jean Girard, uh, also known as Mobius, also known as Gur. Um, he's far more famous for comic books, for doing um, some Silver Surfer comics for Marvel, doing uh, Blueberry, which was a, a French uh, sort of Western comic. And uh, he also did some visual development that we'll get to but this is part of an ad campaign that he illustrated for nescafe the like you know instant coffee brand um i'm not entirely sure what uh the direction was for this maybe a sort of cultured versus uh you know wild sort of thing uh but this is something that jean gerard is going to collaborate with um, Nescafe to sort of make an image that puts their brand out and you know what sort of lifestyle or attitude they they want to depict their brand as to to market to specific consumers that they want to buy their product and here's just another image from that uh, from that campaign here's a really famous uh, American illustrator JC Liondecker who uh, in the you know early part of the 20th century was a household name in the golden age of illustration and Lion Decker worked for Arrow Shirt Collars was one of, one of his many clients uh, and really became known for those ads and you know we can see like Arrow Shirt Collars are it's these types of people this is who wears our product publishing so publishing is huge um, and so the next few things are going to be uh, kind of subsections of publishing. But uh, overall, books and games, some people put uh, greeting cards in there as well. I've put greeting cards under surface design, but it you know can go can go either way. So books. Uh, here's one from Lisk Fang. And Flying Eye Books, and then uh, Sangma Francis is the writer. And this is a nonfiction book about Mount Everest. Um, you know, it's kind of a children's picture book format, but it's uh, you know it's nonfiction. But Flying Eye is a, a fairly small publishing house, and they kind of have this more designerly, more contemporary aesthetic with some. Uh, throwbacks to uh, kind of mid-century illustration and design sensibilities. Uh, book covers, you know, you can do the entire book if, if there are uh, illustrations on the inside, but, you know, middle grade, young adult, and adult fiction, uh, genre fiction, all of that stuff, tend to not have very many interior illustrations. So the, the higher in age you go, the more likely it's just going to be a cover. This is one that illustrator Miley Degnan did for HarperCollins. Uh, here's one for, this is a sort of middle grade book. Um, and the cover art was done by Yuta Onada. Here's one by Jamie Zollers for HMH Kids. So this one is, uh, you know, I think a middle grade as well but it does have some interior illustrations, some, um, some illustrated typography. So that's a thing that some people put under, you know, an entirely different market. Um, and it, it, it makes sense if you want to market yourself that way. If, you know, if the primary thing that you do is uh, illustrated lettering, hand lettering, that sort of thing, uh, there are a lot of people that's, that's their whole gig. Um, Jamie, I believe did both for this. 
uh, and then into like adult fantasy so this is you know adult genre fiction the uh, cover illustration is done by illustrator tommy arnold for tom doherty associates is the publisher but then you're gonna you know you're gonna see in sort of more adult focused sci-fi fantasy you're gonna see more realistic more painterly um sort of there's a lot of like people that are influenced by pre-raphaelite painters uh people doing these you know highly detailed highly rendered uh, sort of realistic very moody sci-fi and fantasy illustrations but again it depends on the publisher there's there's all kinds of different styles there's not one style for any of these markets children's books so children's books um can have a, a pretty long turnaround they can be you know six eight uh, maybe even 18 months long there are a lot of different um, scenarios in which an illustrator illustrates a children's picture book so this one by El Sung Na is one that he wrote and illustrated and then you know pitched to a publisher somebody bought it they worked with him made the book put it out um, so he's you know he's the one that did everything Children's picture books uh, are going to be, you know, below below the age of uh, middle grade, and they're going to be um, they're going to have fewer words. They're going to, you know, heavy on the picture, that sort of thing, uh, you know, relating to a younger audience. Here's another interior spread from that book. And you'll see a lot of the times that you will, uh, you know, this is this is a left-facing and right-facing page. So, you know, imagine that the spine of the book is in the center. You'll have these big, long spreads. So you might have 16 or 18 spreads or something like that. Uh, sometimes there are pages that just have spot illustrations on them. But you'll see, uh, you know, big, big areas left open for setting type into. Here's a spread from a book by illustrator Sarah Jacoby. Uh, here is a super famous book by Eric Carl, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. And so in these Il Sung Na, Sarah Jacoby, Eric Carl, you know, you see these sort of like simpler shapes. Um, some people will associate simpler shapes with that with that style and say, you know, uh, children's books have these simple shapes and you know cute round characters and all of that stuff but that's really not necessarily the case um, here's one from Joyce Hesselberth where we still sort of see that you know these are cute characters simple characters um, but here's one by Shadra Strickland and you know we're seeing this more sort of more realistic uh, you know still this is still uh, heavily stylized, but definitely not the simple shape or, you know, cartoony illustrations, but they're both children's books. Here's one by uh, James Ransom. So again, like these are even more painterly, uh, sort of less stylized, less cartooned. And his, here's an interior from that book. So we're seeing like in this one specifically, more text than some of the other ones but still the spread format um, this book is a little bit more square rather than elongated there are a few different common uh, physical formats for children's picture books and, th and that's all stuff that if if you're interested in working in this market that you'll you'll want to know uh, how many pages are in a standard children's book how you know what are the size formats how do they work because part of um, you know getting work in these markets is formatting the work that you're doing to show that you know how that market works and that you're you can work within those standards with editorial you could have all kinds of different shapes of images so um, you know it might not matter as much in some markets versus others but children's books is definitely one where you're going to want to know what a what a picture book dummy looks like this is also one that's going to involve a lot of pitching so um, you know you can you can pitch your children's book if you wrote and illustrate it um, 
either by yourself or more likely through a children's book agent that will kind of mediate between you and children's book publishers. It's very different than editorial where you don't really need an agent. You can just email art directors. Board and card games. So I put this under publishing because it works uh, in kind of a similar way. Here is one for, this is a Magic the Gathering card. So uh, a game that's pretty old now, over probably 30 years. Um, and kind of one of the first collectible card or trading card games. Uh, obviously a big influence on stuff like Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon card games. Uh, so this is a fantasy game. And this illustration is by Rebecca Gay. A game like this, um, they will release different sets uh, throughout the year. They usually have a core set every couple of years. And they hire a bunch of different illustrators. So Rebecca Gay didn't do all of the cards for, you know, every card for Wizards of the Coast. Uh, here's a board game. So this is Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards. And with something like this, you're going to have a lot of different assets to illustrate. Uh, this one, for instance, has cards, um, little like placards for your character and tokens to move around. Um, I believe there's like a, a three-dimensional standee for the mountain part of the game. Uh, some of them will have miniature figures that you move around. So all kinds of different stuff. Uh, if it's a really large publishing company, this is for Cryptozoic games. If it was for something like Milton Bradley, maybe they have internal graphic designers. Maybe they even have an internal like in-house illustration department. It really depends. Um, for Cryptozoic, I don't, I don't know if uh, Nick Edwards, who did the illustrations for these, also did the graphic design or anything like that, but he definitely is providing the the art for the characters that's being used on the box and the card, uh, tokens, all of that stuff. Um, so lots and lots of different parts. And when you're working on something that's a box or three-dimensional figures, you then have to take into consideration, you know, how they exist in three-dimensional space. Uh, the person, your viewer, your consumer, however you want to think of them, is picking up a thing and turning it in their hands. So you have, you know, a few different considerations than something like editorial, which is something that you're looking at on your screen or in your hands in a newspaper, but like a flat thing. Visual development. Uh, visual development happens for all kinds of markets. Um, you know, if you're working on your own comics or if you're working on comics for Marvel, DC, big publishers, something like that, there is visual development that happens. You know, how do we decide how Spider-Man looks? How do we decide how this city looks? We do visual development. So when a lot of people uh, refer to visual development as a, as a market, they're referring to visual development for animation, uh, video games, and film and television. Here is uh, Jean Girard, also known as Mobius again. This is concept art for uh, a film adaptation of Willow that didn't end up getting made. So you may have seen Willow uh, with Val Kilmer and scary pig monsters and uh, you know baby stealing, but that's not what the movie originally was going to look like. Uh, this is a much darker, sort of more adult version of this movie, and that happens all the time in visual development. Uh, projects get canceled or fall through or change. Uh, there's a really great documentary called Yodorovsky's Dune about um, Alejandro uh, Yodorovsky, who was going to make a film ad adaptation of the sci-fi series Dune, um, and you know had done tons and tons of visual development and writing and all this stuff. It was basically all done except for being shot. And uh, it ended up not being made. And uh, Mobius, Jean Girard, also uh, worked on that film. So here is some character concepts. Uh, for film, a lot of the time, you won't see a lot of um, 
uh, emotion or emoting. You won't see a lot of the like character of the character coming through because the actor is going to do that and the director is going to do that. Um, whereas when you see it for animation, there is no you know human actor, so uh, at least physically. So we have to like figure out how this person behaves and moves on the page. So since this was for a live action movie, it's really just, you know, here's the costuming, here's the look of this character. Uh, here are some, some paintings from Mary Blair. So uh, Mary Blair was a, a big part of the original look of Walt Disney, uh, very, very famous illustrator. Um, this is not something that can, can then be easily animated the you know figures the objects don't have outlines to them so this is to get the mood to you know the the concept the attitude of the film and set sort of the visual style you know this is there is no tree that looks like this this is a an idealized stylized tree uh, and mary blair was part of the part of the team a uh, big part of the team for coming up with a lot of that stuff for early disney films uh here's another one you know for cinderella so again um way 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 too hard to to illustrate this cinderella this isn't final production art this is concept art so you'll see sometimes some roughness or some sketchiness in visual development it's not something that uh you know the style would then necessarily especially not at, at this time would have been then taken to final for a book or editorial or commercial uh, market now though uh a lot of the sort of gouache texture lineless style that's become popular in the last 10 years is uh, is influenced by people like Mary Blair uh, and Avon Durrell. Avon Durrell is another one uh, early early Disney background artist so this is something that I, I don't know exactly what this was used for um, it could have been that you know concepting of what is this world going to look like but this is also uh, something that's highly enough rendered and finished that it could have been used as part of a, a matte painting or a background for animation. So, you know, when you watch those movies, when you watch early Disney or the, the Ralph Bakshi movies, you'll see there's a big difference between how the characters and moving pieces are, are stylized in the background, which are more kind of graphic, uh, graphically painted. And here's another one from Ava and Durrell. You'll see a lot of this sort of stuff influencing uh, people like the you know the team that that did Samurai Jack or um, the Star Wars Clone Wars animation. Uh, here's some more contemporary stuff for Kubo and the Two Strings. This isn't really you know what Kubo looks like in the end, and obviously some of these are very sketchy. You can still see the blue lines. Uh, the under underdrawing on some of these. This is just, you know, all of these decisions that go into what a character looks like. Uh, all these face shapes at the bottom. You know, they didn't just pick a face shape and then run with it. They they really tried out all kinds of different stuff. And there's it's not just one or two people for something like Disney or Pixar or DreamWorks. It's a whole team of people, uh, usually with a sort of character design lead or a background design lead. And there's also going to be people that just draw all the props. You know, if you think about a cartoon like Adventure Time, uh, there's someone who is coming up with concept f for the characters. There's someone who's coming up with backgrounds. And there's someone who's coming up with all of the objects that any character or background uh, is occupied by or interacts with. So it ends up being a large team. A lot of the animation for some of those shows is done uh, by separate companies overseas. So here's some more from Kubo. So you can see like, this is a completely different drawing style. Um, and some of the finals are much more finished, but it still doesn't really look like Kubo, which had a, a more you know three-dimensional look because it was three-dimensional. But um, that's the big thing with visual development is it's not it's not just one option you don't just pick a character design or a background design and go okay this is it now that part's done uh, there's tons and tons of drawing um, and until recently a lot of that stuff would never be seen by the public uh, it's really nice now that Pixar and Disney will put out books with character design and, and concept art uh, after movies come out 
and even that the stuff that's published is not nearly all of it another part of visual development for live action and animated films and um, you know commercial advertisements and uh, television is storyboarding so this these are storyboards for Alfred Hitchcock's movie the birds and you can see you know it's it's really just sort of trying to figure out the framing the cinematography on paper because that's a lot easier and quicker and cheaper than just going out and running through loads of expensive uh, physical film and paying actors and paying grips and and you know paying all of these people to go out and actually film things so before any of that happens we draw it out and uh, so it's a sequential process but the frame is always going to be the same you know whatever the aspect ratio is for the film there's also a thing that's similar to storyboarding but it's called beat boards so these are uh, beat boards for Paranorman um, where you have fewer frames and they really are they're just trying to hit the narrative beats of the frame so like when things that are important happen whereas a storyboard is really going to be um, kind of all the way through all of the all of the motion uh, so pretty often when these are done they're then turned into an animatic which is uh, you know looks like just really choppy animation but it is moving in time you know it kind of helps with the pacing with something like this when every box is the same size it has a really sort of monotonous beat uh, that doesn't really reflect the timing and pacing and mood of the film. Okay, so surface design. Um, some of this stuff, like cards, I mentioned, some people put under publishing. So I have it. I have it here under surface design. Um, clothing, packaging, cards. So this is illustration that's meant to adorn uh, surfaces that are not. Uh, you know, not quite the same use as an illustration that uh, would be a book cover or a um, yeah, an editorial illustration. Oftentimes, with surface design, there is uh, you know repeating patterns. So, if you're looking, uh, if you're interested in pattern work, um, this is a pretty good market for you. But they don't all have to be repeating patterns. So, this is surface design for uh, Hudson Valley Seed Company by illustrator Lisa Perrin. And so you can see the shape of this thing. Imagine folding those semicircle wings in on the back and that's how this package works. And it has seeds in it. If you've ever bought seeds at, the, at a garden store or a hardware store, um, you'll know that they come in these tiny little envelopes basically. So this is uh, Hudson Valley does calls for artists uh, every year. They put out these sort of artist series card packages or seed packages um, and Lisa has done a few for them I think. Uh, so they don't all have the same illustrator. They have these kind of different vibes to them. So this one is a very you know sort of regal and ornate uh, vibe to it which, you know, kind of makes sense with it. It's called the Velvet Queen Sunflower. Sure, that seems fancy. Uh, greeting cards. So this is by illustrator Miley Degnan. So I showed you a book cover of hers earlier. Um, Miley, I believe, makes these cards herself and sells them herself. So some people do that. Uh, and then some people work for uh, American Greetings or, or Hallmark and they, uh, they're an in-house illustrator for, for those companies and they make greeting cards for them. Here is a repeating pattern from illustrator Phoebe Wall. And these, uh, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, but um, I think she made these just to sell on Spoonflower. So there are websites like Society6 or Spoonflower where you can upload a design, they'll print it on things, they kind of act like a drop shipper or, or you know, an in-between that uh, customers can go to spoonflower.com and buy bolts of fabric that have an illustration on them that they like. 
when you're trying to you know cover an entire bolt of fabric or you know rolls of wallpaper or wrapping paper or something like that that's where repeating repeating tile patterns come into play um, also some uh, textiles and, and clothing I'll show here in a minute uh, and here's another one from Phoebe Wall they can get really intricate and ornate there's all kinds of different ways to uh, tile and repeat a pattern um, you know, when you when you start sort of getting into surface design and pattern making and looking around in the world, you're going to see examples of it all the time. Here's a pretty common thing that uh, surface designers will do. This is from Rachel Taylor. So this is a digital mock-up of a repeating pattern sort of being shown in its use. You can tell if you look closely enough, especially kind of at the edges of the, the plant, that this isn't real. They didn't really wallpaper the wall with this. Uh, but what this illustrator designer has done is sort of taken a photo, probably with a blank wall, and cut everything out so that they can lay in an overlaying pattern digitally and show uh, a pretty, pretty good example of what this would look like on a large surface. You know, it's one thing to design a repeating pattern, and it's another thing to understand how that would look just looking at the repeating square as something like wallpaper or on a large textile surface like a blanket or something, curtains. Uh, so that's a pretty common practice in surface design. Another thing is licensing. So you can make these designs and uh, either put them on your own website or websites dedicated to surface design uh, licensing and potential clients or customers can go there and see your work and buy things that they like for specific types of use. So, you know, maybe they're just buying the licensing rights for one or two or three years of this pattern for clothing specifically. Then your that pattern is still open for licensing from someone else who wants to use it as, um, you know, stationary or wallpaper or something like that. So the, you know, uh, the dynamics of licensing, are, uh, there's a lot of them. But it's, it's kind of nice that you can, you know, make things in advance and get paid for them after the fact. Uh, or someone can buy non-exclusive licensing rights. And so, you know, 10 people could buy the same licensing f for the same pattern, and you're getting paid by 10 different people for, for one illustration. Here's another one from Marcos Chin. So I showed the, the one earlier for Lava Life, a commercial illustration. This was actually done initially for uh, an editorial article uh, for HERS magazine, HERS. Uh, but then he took that and turned it into a repeating pattern for sportswear. So there's a lot of uh, you know overlap there again. Comics. Uh, comics is a pretty big one too. Um, all of the you know, facets of comics don't really work the same way, but, you know, they're going to be sort of lumped together by being the sequential uh, comic form. So the mainstream comics, uh, DC, Marvel, uh, Dark Horse, and uh, Image are, are pretty big too, but DC and Marvel are still the largest, um, you know, they make comics, they make superhero books. So here's one, a cover for Batgirl from DC by Babs Tarr. Uh, and here's an interior page from Elektra from Marvel by illustrator Bill Sienkiewicz. So sometimes people will talk about there being a comic style. Um, there really isn't a comic style. Uh, you know, if we look at this, this is usually what people are talking about, this sort of outlined, flat colored or cell shaded um, you know, st uh, stylized in a specific way sort of drawing. But these are very different. You know, that top panel is a rendered painting. Um, and he kind of, Bill Sienkiewicz used all of these traditional texturing and painting techniques to, to really make uh, really visually interesting and different looking comics. Um, you'll see that too in people like Alex Ross, who was making oil paintings for, for DC. And then here's Mike Mignola uh, for Hellboy, his own comic for uh, Dark Horse Comics. 
So with this, we see, you know, some of those outlines coming back and flat colors coming back. But stylistically, it's quite a bit different than the Batgirl stuff. And, it, you know, it's going to be different than uh, something like this, which was uh, sort of a early 90s Adam Kubert Wolverine book. Another thing to keep in mind is that there isn't just one, uh, there isn't just one person who's working on these. So Adam Kubert is sort of uh, credited as the illustrator on this, but Adam Kubert did the pencils. So the inkers on this book were Mark Farmer and Mike Sellers. The letterer, the letterer was Pat Brossier. The colorist was uh, Steve Bucoletto. There was also an editor and an editor in chief uh, and a writer. So big, uh, you know, big two Marvel and DC comics. It's kind of a team effort. Some people will do the pencils and the the letters. Um, you know, if we go back to someone like Bill Sienkiewicz, uh he's doing. You know, it's not, there's not an anchor. He's just doing all of the drawing. So you really could say that he is the illustrator for this. But um, you know, it can it can come in different forms. So now on to uh, other types of sort of mainstream comics. I mean, these are these are independent comics, but the publishers for them have gotten very large. So uh, this is Chris Ware, uh, you know, considered one of the greatest living cartoonists. Uh, for his book, Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Kid on Earth. So you'll see, you know, again, we understand that it's a comic because we are using some of the, you know, panel forms, the, you know, uh, sort of formal elements that we understand as comics, although there, there are examples where those just get completely blown out of the water. So we do understand that this is a comic, but when you say, you know, comic style, it doesn't really look like the other comics that I've shown. It's, you know, quite a bit different from this. Marvel book from the 90s and this uh, Dark Horse book from the sort of mid 2000s uh, but this was a uh, actually I have no idea when this came out uh, but you know it doesn't doesn't fit into the comic style of the other comics shown uh, this is Box Brown for a comic biography of a professional wrestler and actor uh, Andre the Giant so in the independent comics or the smaller publisher comics, uh, there's, there's often options just to tell different stories. Jimmy Corrigan is a very sad book. It's a very depressing book. Uh, Marvel and DC may have some sad books, but they're, you know, overall they're telling genre, genre fiction stories. In independent comics, you get different, more personal stories or things that are less mass marketable uh, here's another one so this is a pretty small publisher called Silver Sprocket uh, and the illustrator the, the creator of this book Ben Passmore uh, your black friend and other strangers you know this is not something that you're going to see published by Marvel or DC or even Dark Horse or Image for that matter and it's a pretty short book it's only a few only a few pages long so in that smaller press you have a lot more uh, creative freedom and control over your own product. So that, that draws a lot of people to it. Um, one of the things that you sacrifice in that market is a large company kind of telling you what to do and taking care of marketing and all of that stuff. So, you know, when I, when I make uh, independently published books, it's then my responsibility to sell them as well. Whereas if you're an illustrator for Marvel, you don't have to go you know, face to face with people trying to get them to buy Daredevil or something. There's a you know marketing arm of the company that does that for you. So that's kind of the trade off. Uh, also, newspaper comics. There, uh, you know, fewer people are reading physical newspapers, but the newspaper comic or the strip comic style still kind of exists. If you if you look at web comics, which we will hear in a second. But uh, this is a super famous one by Walt Kelly called Pogo. You know, funny animal comics, uh, although this one had a lot of um, sort of uh, cultural commentary and political commentary in it. So it's not, you know, the idea 
sometimes uh, the general idea is that these were sort of uh, dumbed down funny animal comics for kids but that wasn't always necessarily the the case and this comic in particular pogo was a big influence on stuff like um like jeff smith's bone so they they kind of were a, a prevailing force uh, here's another one, Holly Harrington. So this comic was uh, a one one panel uh, sort of commentary comic run in Amsterdam News, which came out of the uh, Har Harlem Renaissance area of of time. So this originally the comic was called Dark Laughter, and then was changed to Bootsy after the sort of most famous uh, and beloved character from the from the comics called Bootsy. So <clears throat> going into the web comic format or digital comics, you no longer have to worry about the physical format of a printed book. So you can do kind of whatever you want. Here's one by Alex Citrin. So uh, I showed earlier uh, an editorial illustration of hers. So this is an editorial comic. And the format of it is you know, something that wouldn't be very easily printed this sort of long, uh, you know, it, it works much better as something that you scroll through. So there are some digital comics like Penny Arcade that have kind of stuck to the three panel uh, newspaper strip format. And then there's uh, all kinds of other creators who have used sort of the uniqueness of, uh, or the possibilities of digital presentation to do fun or different stuff uh, with their comics so this you know comic uh, the order of the panels and the way that you move through the panels is um, is really important to the narrative and pacing of a comic and there's just things that you can do digitally that you can't do in print also it's a lot cheaper and often free to publish digital comics digitally so that's another thing to keep in mind Animation. So this is the actual making things move rather than the visual development part of animation. So uh, animation dips into a lot of these different things. You can have editorial animation, um, advertising, music videos, motion graphics, independent film, all kinds of um, markets for this. So here's one from Shir Wang that hopefully will play. And this is animation for a uh, music video for Ian Chang. So this is something where the uh, and Cher is, uh, is also an illustrator, and she also does um, editorial animation. She does static illustration, uh, all, all kinds of stuff, and has a really unique and really interesting style. So, you know, it's if you can draw a single frame, and then you can draw what happens next, and you do that 12 times or 24 times, you have done animation. It's just a bunch of, you know, static drawings that kind of go together. Um, this is a pretty common thing now for all illustrators to have some experience with doing, uh, doing animated work, and it's gotten a lot easier. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to have big traditional rigs and and stop motion rigs and expensive software. Um, you know, Photoshop does a lot of uh, animation work pretty pretty easily. Um, if you are sort of pitching yourself as an animator, one thing that you'll probably need is is what's called a demo reel. So this is uh, Kyle Parnell. My apologies that this is kind of clunky showing a video inside of a video. Uh, but you know, this is going to be just an example of your animated work, sort of you know, a, a sm small section of clips from it that works the same way as a portfolio. 
and you can see like there are some formal stylistic sensibilities there's also some like uh, conceptual stylistic sensibilities that ties this person's work together so you know go out find uh, animators online uh, there's tons and tons of them and you'll see more examples of of sort of how that market works but uh, you know lots of companies hire animators for uh, commercial market stuff uh, there's obviously animated film and television um, now that editorial markets use a lot of digital platforms there's editorial animation so institutional uh, institutional is government universities nonprofits museums and corporations for like internal design so you know let's say a, a company was going to put together a packet for their employees it's not public facing it's it's interior facing um, here's another one by Kadir Nelson for the National Pastime Museum uh, so you know institutional illustration can look a lot like other other forms of illustration here's one from uh, illustrator Christina Hess for the US Mint so you know somebody has to draw the the thing that goes on coins and then here's one finally from Whitney Sherman for the United States Postal Service so you know stamps have pictures on them somebody illustrated that picture uh, video games so a lot of the stuff that you would need to do to work in video games is the same stuff that you would need as an illustrator to do anything in the other markets of illustration so you've got large studios and independent studios but otherwise it's going to be really similar jobs and your portfolio is just going to be arranged a little bit differently so for instance a texture artist portfolio if you were applying for a job at a studio for a texture artist if you are one of the you know sort of realistic painting uh, sci-fi fantasy book cover artists then you've already had to learn to render textures over a form and the only difference here is that maybe you're going to change that form to a bunch of cubes and you're just going to have a bunch of uh, you know textures painted over top of them these tend to be more uh, siloed so and and directed so if you want to be a character illustrator a character concept artist you're gonna have a portfolio full of concept art for characters rather than throwing in also textures and props and whatever um, you'll have different portfolios for different jobs there's also stuff like uh, 3d modelers and uh, riggers under animators so that's the person who's taking all these digital forms and um, tying them to other digital forms so that they can then be animated basically like a puppet uh, and also the the user interface or UI artist so you know who is designing and illustrating um, menus and layouts and, and that sort of thing uh, also there are other markets so I can't cover every market of illustration um, there are some that are very very small and very niche uh, there are others that kind of require different types of schooling so like most fine art or most commercial art illustration programs that you're going to find don't have any sort of uh, uh, plan for medical illustration where you'll find that is through hospitals um, but they require the same things as some other markets of illustration again so you know look out there like look at your favorite illustrators what are they doing who do they work for how do they put their portfolios together what different markets kind of go well together um, you know comics and editorial go really well together right now uh, and and keep up with those pay attention to how they change maybe maybe sci-fi fantasy illustration for the publishers that you're interested in now have a certain look to the books that they put out that doesn't really vibe with the kind of stuff that you do stylistically but that can change and it has changed over time so that's my presentation about markets uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and found it helpful uh, and I will talk to you soon